A very warm welcome to the Cricket Library podcast. My name is Matt Ellis and it's wonderful to have your company as always. And a very warm welcome to anyone listening to the podcast for the first time. It's great to have you with us. We love talking cricket with passionate cricket people and we've been having some great conversations in the last little while. We had Peter George who played a test match for Australia and he's invented some new technology. That's a chat that I'd recommend you go back and have a listen to if you haven't already. Nathan Horitz is in there, Leah Poulton and Tim Ludeman, Graham Winter, sports psychologist, and they're all available at all the usual places, iTunes, iHeartRadio, and the Today's Tale website, where I also do a bit of writing. You can have a look at that there as well. And today's guest is a very special one. She played for Australia across three formats, a test match. She played in 30 one-day internationals and 18 T20 internationals. She is a very passionate cricket person. She took some bold plunges in her career to get where she needed to be. And we'll ask her about that. We'll ask her about her time captaining the Melbourne Stars and how she went about setting the culture as the captain of that group. Uh, We'll talk about her time at the 2017 World Cup. We'll ask her about the magic day where she took six for 20 against the ACT, including a hat-trick. That was a magnificent weekend for her, 10 wickets for the weekend. So we'll find out what that was like. We'll ask her about a club cricket experience at EMP in Victoria. Uh, Lots of us have those club cricket stories and Kristen certainly has some fond memories of playing at EMP. But now it's time to sit back, relax and enjoy our chat with Kristen Beams. It's a very warm welcome to the Cricket Library podcast, Kristen Beams. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, thanks for having me, Matt. It's good to be here. Now, Kristen, we we like to find out uh, where your passion for the game started. You grew up in Tasmania and you've gone on to do amazing things in your in your cricketing career. But where did it all begin for you? Where did that fire get lit uh, for Kristen Beams? Yeah, well, I think for like most people, you start, you know, that the play the game, you started playing in the backyard and, and that's how you got intro into it. And, and people ask me all the time, do you have an older brother? And I do. My, my brother Todd is, is two years older than me. But I don't have one of those sort of stereotypical stories. He hated cricket, uh, couldn't stand wow. it, didn't want to play it. And I think, but my dad loved the game, never really played it himself, just a passion for it. And so I, I feel like I kind of filled that void for him. And I was really happy to be outdoors, playing every sport. So you learn to, you know, kick a drop punt, play cricket, um, shoot a basketball, do all of those sorts of things. And for me, I don't know why, but cricket sort of just landed for me. And in a lot of ways, I feel really lucky because I watched a lot of cricket on TV not with any real um, idea that, well, actually, I didn't really see any women do it. And so I just fell in love with the game and wanted to play the game without the knowledge that girls really didn't play. And I, I remember coming home from like the very first training session that I went to and then sort of having this realisation of I, I was the only girl there. Um, wow. And, I, uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm grateful to my parents for that because I fell in love with the game without any knowledge of it. And I, and I think that... So by that point, I was never going to give it up, uh, regardless of whether girls did or, or didn't play. And I, uh, I always think that's such a gift um, from your parents to kind of just let you go out and explore it. And they must have been thinking at the time, yeah, it's going to be hard for her to find a girls team. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I understand you played a bit of indoor cricket as well when you're in primary school. Can you tell us a bit about yeah. your indoor cricket experience? Yeah, because I, I think for me, it was just about I wanted to play the game and you know, in, in primary school, I used to, to kick around with, with these boys who, who like to play cricket um, in the lunch break. And, and then all of a sudden, they were sort of like, well, I reckon we can enter a, a team in the in the local indoor comp. And, and that was, you know, I was like, well, I've never heard of indoor cricket, but it's cricket. It's got cricket in it. I'm prepared to have a go at it. And they were the, the tamer tigers. Uh, we were, and, and all of a sudden it was something that, you know, it was it was a way to be involved. And, you know, I saw the occasional girl there, 
Um, but for me, that's, that was where I sort of started. That was my first sort of intro into the game. And, and from there was when someone from, someone must have contacted Cricket Tasmania and said, Hey, there's a girl here and we think she's okay. And, uh, from there I went in and had my, my very first training session, um, at the NTCA indoor net with, um, the regional cricket manager whose name was Tim Coyle. And he would go on to be a hugely influential person in, in my career. Absolutely. And from, from there, uh, you're a youngster, you're learning the game. When did you discover leg spin bowling? I had a coach and I would have been, I would have been about sort of 14, I reckon. And I'm, I'm about the same height now as I was when I was 12. So I grew quite quickly when I was a, a kid and then I sort of didn't grow very much. And I had a coach sort of say, look, you know, kind of everyone bowls right arm medium pace. You know, have you thought about doing something different? And I thought, yeah, you know what? Why not? Why don't I try something different? And, you know, at that time, so Tim May and Shane Warren were the two significant spinners uh, for Australia. And um, the backyard at our house had a bit of a slope downward. So I sort of tried bowling sort of off spin and leg spin. Um, but it leg spin sort of took because it would it sort of go up the hill rather than down. And so I think it was probably a combination of my backyard, um, I guess, pitch and, and also the, the fact that Shane Warne was really at the, the height of his powers uh, and it was such a popular thing. And so from there it just sort of it was like right, oh I'm gonna I'm gonna bowl I'm gonna bowl leg spin. And and are you still playing with the boys at this stage? You're playing local club cricket in Tasmania at the time? Yeah, there wasn't really a, a women's competition. There was sort of it, there was one that sort of survived for a couple of years, and it was in Hobart. So it was a, a five-hour round trip for for my mum on Sunday morning uh, to to do that. And and I reckon I was about fourteen or fifteen. But prior to that, and then after that, I I played men's cricket and uh, and boys cricket, and I continued to do that until I moved to Melbourne. So you know, even when I was sort of nineteen, twenty, I was playing men's grade cricket in Launceston and, and Hobart and you know I, I don't look back on those experiences as negative experiences I look back on them more as the things that really shaped the way that I played um, yeah. and, and I see them only really as positive. And I understand you had one of the coolest jobs going around uh, a room attendant uh, for the cricket can you tell us a bit about about that job and how that came about? Yeah, it was it was really a, a random thing, and the the Australian women's team were playing a Rose Bowl game at Bell Reeve, and I, you know, I, I it was such a big deal because I'd never even seen a women's game before. Um, I was pretty lucky. The cricket pads used to on the old sort of video. They used to video Rose Bowl games because they would get sometimes they would get on the TV, and so I would watch women's games on video. And so this was my chance to actually go and watch a game. And I couldn't believe it. I was like, this is going to be amazing. I'm going to go and watch the Australian women's team play at Bell Reeve. And I was like, this is, this is a dream. This is what I want to do. And anyway, I got this phone call to say, would you be interested in being a room attendant? And I was like, well, yeah, of course. Um, and so I had this really incredible day. Um, or it would end up being a, a day in a bit. I had the chance to train with the team. Um, and then be the room attendant. And ironically, I would have actually been paid more than any of the girls that played for Australia that day. Cause I remember getting a hundred <laughs> bucks for room attending. And I, and I basically did not lift a finger. Um, Lisa Kitely was the 13th and Clea Smith was the 12th at the time. Yeah. And neither of them would let me do anything. So I basically sat with this incredible view on the game and watched the Australian women's team and they were making me cups of tea making sure I had something to eat. I just had this, you know, amazing, um, I guess, ex- first experience of actually watching women's cricket. And it's something that sort of stayed with me. And, you know, uh, I look back at now and think, wow, you know, I met Clea Smith. I was like, wow, she's amazing. And I would go on to, she would be a teammate of mine. She was my club captain. Uh, and I worked for it for, at the Australian Cricketers Association. She's such a dear friend. And, you know, we just randomly crossed paths, me just being this sort of country Tasmanian kid who's sort of room attending for Australia and sometimes those little bits of luck sort of stay with you your whole life, I think. So when does the country kid from Tasmania uh, light up the dream of, of playing 
cricket to the level, to the next kind of level up, you, you take a very bold step of joining EMP, uh, the club the club side in Victoria. Can you tell us a bit about how that came about and um, who who were the people kind of supporting you through that time? Because that's a, a massive decision for a young person to make to to give something like that a crack. Can you give us a bit of a backstory around uh, what led to your move to Victoria? Yeah, and it's probably a bigger decision then than it was now. I think we see so many players move around for – for opportunity and, and for different reasons. and But back in, in that time, even though Tasmania weren't in the WNCL, it sort of wasn't the done thing that you would go somewhere else to play. And I was lucky enough, I was in the shooting stars. I was sort of in and out of that. And um, and I never really, I, didn't, I hadn't felt like I'd sort of taken my game anywhere. And I A random email. I, I was working at the time for Cricket Tasmania um, as the women's cricket officer. I was I was 20. Yep. And they had given me my first full-time job. And an email came through from Mel Jones. And it said, look, we, we had some interest in um, having you involved here in Victoria. We want to see if you're interested in playing some club cricket and maybe, you know, attending the, the Victorian camp. And so that's what I did. I, I jumped on a plane and I, I went across and, and went to the camp. And, you know, it was an incredible experience. It was you know, with so many Australian players, you know, Catherine Fitzpatrick was in that team, Mel Jones, Cliff Smith, like it was, it was a kind of a star-studded lineup, and you know, I was well and truly out of my depth. And I, I met with with three cricket clubs, and and one would be EMP, and I just thought, wow, this 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 sounds amazing. You know, a women's club. I've never experienced playing that sort of women's cricket, and so I, I said, yeah, let's do it. And Cricket Tasmania were really supportive. They understood that. There was no WNCL team at that time, but I had a job um, and I was still playing, you know, I was going to still play second 11 for Tasmania, which was a competition that existed at that time. So they sort of helped cover some of the cost of the, the flight to cross. And so I played for the six or so games in the first year, loved it, uh, became part of the Victorian squad and then flew across for more games. I, I pretty much flew every weekend. So I worked Monday through to, to Friday night. Most Saturday mornings got on the 6 a.m. cheapy flight to, to Melbourne and then went home on the 9.15 p.m., which was the last flight on a Sunday, which was also really cheap, um, and spent my weekend uh, in in Melbourne playing cricket and managed to debut to Victoria, which was incredible, and got dropped in the same year. And wow. that was a, a really interesting experience to go, wow, you know, you've gone from, wow, this is incredible, maybe I'm going to be a, good enough to play at this level to – you know what, maybe maybe you're not. Like you you got your opportunity, you didn't take it. And so I just felt like I was at a crossroads and it was about either waiting, playing the waiting game, um, and hoping Tasmania get a team or making the decision to go. And I, I like to think of myself as a bit of an all or nothing person and I wanted to be all in. Uh, I wanted to know whether I was good enough to play WNCL cricket or not. Um there was no encouragement from Cricket Victoria. They, they were sort of very clear to say, look, we're not going to take other states' players. Yep. Um, and I was like, you know what, I'm going to do it. And Mel Jones rang me one day and said, uh, one of my housemates is going to move out. Um, you interested in a spare room at, at my place? And I was like, I would love that. I'm going to try and get myself <laughs> a job. Um, so my parents said, my dad's only rule was, if you're going to go, you've got to have a full-time job. Okay. Um, at that time, there was obviously no no payment for for playing cricket at that time. So I was like, "All right, let's let's do this." And um, we had a wonderful PDM Ben Robertson for Cricket Victoria, and and he he helped me out a lot. And I ended up getting a job at Cricket Australia. Wow. And so with yeah, within sort of I made the decision I wanted to go, and within sort of four months, I was living in Melbourne. Um, and starting my first pre-season for Victoria. I think I was a rookie contracted player um, in that year and, you know, the rest kind of ends up being history, I guess. Now, you speak about um, your dad wanting you to have that full-time job and uh, I've spoken to one of your teammates actually and, and she was giving me a bit of intel before talking to you and she said one of the things you were really good at is uh, that you're good at not living in the cricket bubble. You're good at having interests outside of the game. Do you, do you think it helped you coming into cricket in a time where it was uh, an, kind of an add-on 
to what you were doing in your normal day to day life? It wasn't a full time profession, or can you can you reflect on on how that uh, may have helped you coming in at that time? Yeah, I think for a lot of reasons it was helpful. I think that your identity isn't cricket. You know, we when we started, we were we had full time jobs and. You know, they're the things that pay the mortgage and put food on the table and do those things. So you take them really seriously and, and cricket becomes a, a real bonus. So it becomes, I always felt like we were really grateful for trainings, for games, for eating noodles after an MCG training that finishes at 8.30, knowing that you've got to get up and go to work the next day. We were really grateful for all of those moments because it, it was incredible. It was it, it wasn't the thing we did all of the time. You know, we worked normal jobs, but then we got put on this, you know, navy blue uniform with a big B on the front and we're like, How good is this? So it was I think from that point of view, I think we were were probably lucky. But also at the same time I, I think I learned a lot about being a professional cricketer and you know, not to sound disrespectful to the current generations or, you know, generations that follow, but for me the professionalism of players when I started playing was so high, you know, you've got people like Catherine Fitzpatrick, you know, they're professional players before there was any dollars attached to it. And a lot of times we talk about professional sport and we go straight to money. Yeah. You know, I think I, I learned from the Catherine Fitzpatrick, the Jane Franklin's, the Kelly Appleys, the Claire Smith, there were so many that I could name and how they managed to hold down a job and then still be, you know, incredibly fit. They were doing extras, uh, Kelly Appleby worked as a baker for a really long time. So wow. she had a 3.30 a.m. start and she would work through till about 1 o'clock. She would go to Catherine Fitzpatrick's house and have a nap and then get a lift <laughs> to training and then train for two and a half hours. You know, like you, you can't help but just go, wow, you know, these people are so professional. Um, and for me, I was just a you know a kid from Tasmania that hadn't learnt those sorts of things. And so I, I think that was really helpful to have longevity in my career, um, even when there was money and there was other things attached to it, it was like, well, I'd already learned those lessons. I wouldn't say I implemented them straight away. I, I think it took me too long to work out, you know, how, how fit I needed to be and how hard I needed to work. I think I enjoyed the game a lot as a young player, which most do. It took me a bit too long to get it together, but I had really strong role models um, and they all – they, they all, all of them weren't really defined by the game. They, they all had careers. There's the physios and um, school teachers and coaches and so many other um, things going on. And it's, it's probably the thing that stays with me a little bit whenever I'm talking to younger players. I always say, wow, guys, you've got you to have something else because, you know, the worst thing that can happen is that every, everything hangs on every day. You know, that the, my hammy's a bit sore, like that becomes, you know, such a big deal or I missed out on the weekend. That's a big deal. Whereas I think when you've got other things going on, you can kind of rationalize it a little bit easier. And I think if you want to have longevity as a player, I think you have to do that. And what, what are some of the things you enjoy doing outside of cricket? Do you have uh, other, other hobbies that you like to fill your time with or did you find that it was just uh, a case of you, you're in work mode and then uh, just as you mentioned that that sheer joy of going to cricket training and being with your, your, your cricket family and playing the game with them was really something to look forward to. Uh, were, there, were there any other outside interests? I think initially it was a lot, it was work because it had to be full time and and, and that took up so much of the time. But uh, I think one of the, the really consistent things for me across my career was actually my cricket club, um, Essendon and Barabin on Park Ladies Cricket Club. And just, and not so much because of the cricket. Uh, it was a lot to do with the people. I think there's so many people within that club that opened a door to something or introduced me to something or taught me something. And again, we're talking about really strong women um, from all different backgrounds. And so, you know, not only is the club this sort of social epicenter outside of, you know, playing for Victoria or work or whatever it might be, but yeah, I, I just think it, for me, it, I, you know, I lived with one of the ladies for a little while when the house I was living in got renovated. One of them put my hand, put my name in for something and I picked up this and then I had a job over here. I worked for Claire Smith, which I talked about. So uh, I think it had a lot to, all of our social, all of the learning came from those people. And it's just learning from 
from strong women and, and having those different experiences. And I think they taught me a lot. I ended up, I used to, I, I don't do it anymore, unfortunately, now that I'm living in Hobart, but I used to play golf with, with one of the ladies at the, the club who was the, the first ever woman to play Saturday golf. Oh, wow. Um, at a, at the Medway Golf Club. And she changed the rules by getting herself on the board because she was a working mum. And so she wanted to change the way she wanted women to be able to play golf on when they wanted to, when it was convenient. And so we took, you know, like I met so many people like that and she'd be incredible. We'd jump in the cart and go and hit golf balls. And so, I, you know, I think a lot of the, the really good things that I did outside of the game could actually be linked to the club and to the, the people that made it up. And, you know, it's probably the hardest thing about not living in Melbourne is actually that, that face-to-face physical connection that, that you no longer get with your club. And it sounds like uh, a real driver for the positive culture at EMP was the relationships that the players had. Uh, and that actually transferred to some on-field success. Uh, what was it like breaking the premiership drought there? I think it was 07, 08. Um, it had been a long time between drinks to, to finally win that premiership. Uh, how, how was that, being, being a part of that success? It was the first premiership I'd ever been a part of and it, I had no idea how special premierships were until that point and everyone wants to win premierships, everyone wants to win trophies and, you know, I'd, I'd grown up most of my life playing cricket for Tasmania and, you know, without sounding disrespectful, we didn't win too many games, let alone even be in contention for, to win trophies and uh, it was my second year at EMP and I sort of by that time got to, to know some of the people. But I, I, if I close my eyes and, and stop and think about it, I can actually remember and I probably start to feel emotional about it. But I remember walking off the ground and all of the past players and, you know, we're talking past players who are in their 20s, but past players who are in their 60s and 70s. Yeah. And they all were walking out onto the ground towards us crying and just tears of like, pure joy that that this current group of players had had premiership success. And I think that's something that's always been really important to me since that moment is going, wow, you've actually got to have such a good knowledge of the past and the traditions and everything that goes into the club. And I was like, wow, this is so much more than just winning a trophy or winning a premiership. This This means a lot to people over a really extended period of time. And, you know, it's, I think it's really easy as a cricketer to think about what it means for you. You know, oh, did I have a good game? Or yeah, that's good. I was a part of that premiership. But actually, feeling like you were bigger, you were part of something that was so much bigger than you. That was that was without a doubt. I, I would say that's my cricketing highlight is being a part of that premiership because I felt like I belonged to something yep. that was going to stand the test of time. Yeah, something bigger than yourself to be a part of and contribute to. Uh, highly satisfying and and. There's so many of us that don't get to elite level cricket that get to experience that as well. That's one of the things I love about the game. There are club cricketers everywhere who can have an experience like that. Uh, Now, you have some success at Victoria. Now, the WNCL competition largely dominated by New South Wales, uh, but the T20 format, Victoria found a way to get over the top of New South Wales I think it was three years in a row, 09, 10, 10, 11, 11, 12. Uh, what, was, what was it like uh, for you to be a part of that group and what are your recollections of, of winning those T20 titles with Victoria? You know, I was actually asked recently about um, success for Victoria and people said, you know, like, do you, do you feel like it was a successful time? And I said, well, you know, to not win a WNCL title is, is – is certainly something I would consider to be, you know, unfinished business. And, you know, then I started to talk about the T20s and it's funny how quickly we forget about that sort of whole time because of the big bash. Um, but it was such an incredible time. It was because it was a really diverse Victorian team over that time. There were still some senior players playing, but there was this really strong emergence of, of young talent you know, like with the likes of Villani, Cameron, Lanning, they're all sort of coming through at the same time. So it was a really fun period of time for, for Victoria and, and probably 
we thought it would probably hopefully transfer over to 50 over cricket, which it didn't. But I, I think it, it started to say, it started to sort of breed this idea that, that we could beat New South Wales and it was, um, it was going to be a format that, that we could excel in. And I think we were also very lucky to have a lot of players in that time that I, I think they would have wished they were born in a different generation. So yeah. like a, you know, for me, like a clear Smith would have been, you know, uh, you know, asking for top dollar in WBBL right now if she was playing um, yeah. because she had a skill set that was conducive to that. Same with Catherine Fitzpatrick and, and some of those players. So we were nearly ahead of the game. We had these players who liked to take the game on at a time when you sort of didn't do it in 50 over cricket. You know, WNCL was sort of dominated. If you made 180 in a WNCL game, you'd sort of go, oh, this is going to be pretty easy. This will be a walk in the park from from a bowling point of view. So it it felt like we were get, we were actually a part of the game shifting, um, yeah. and it's probably I didn't I didn't think that at the time, um, but I think now that I look back on it, I go, wow, you know, it was great to to win those premierships and be able to do that for Victoria, but actually saying, well, we might have been a part of you know the shift that the game has seen, and and so many of those girls went on to win World Cups for Australia um, that were a part of that Victorian team, and uh, yeah, I always sort of smile just thinking about that. Yeah, well, that 10-11 final of only four runs in it, you just have a look at the scorecards from that one. Victoria, five for 161, Meg Lanning smashing them, 74 off 56. And then in reply, New South Wales, nine for 157, Leah Poulton, 76 off 45. And you you look at those kind of numbers and they're, they're the kind of numbers that are you'd be thrilled about in a in a WBBL game. So, And that was happening before WBBL existed. And I'm just wondering um, your views on uh, just the transition from that into the, the franchise model of the WBBL. Do you think it was helpful having those few seasons there before um, WBBL was a, w- w- was a competition? Yeah, I definitely do. And I think there's, there's been so much talk about AFLW and, and comparing it to the WBBL and, you know, there's, there's good and bad of both. I mean, from a, an AFLW point of view, the product probably wasn't at the level that cricket was because cricket had had this really long history of, of playing that format to get to the, the point where it became this sort of TV, this, this thing that people were going to go on and turn on their TV to watch. And the AFL just kind of shoved it in. And, I love that they did that because they put it in and said, you know what it's going to take, which it, it absolutely did. But, you know, looking at it from a um, just a pure skill perspective, I, I think I look at the, the WBBL and think, wow, we were actually really lucky to be playing the format with sort of the handbrake off with no fear. Because when we started playing T20 cricket state-based, it was actually just an additional game. So we were yeah. playing WNCL Saturday, Sunday. So then it became Friday afternoons was, T20 and it had to be afternoon because everyone worked. So you'd take the afternoon off work, play T20. So it was played without fear and that's why I think we did see those kind of scores and there was no fear of failure. It was like, well, we don't know what this format is. Who's going to play it? So I think we sort of really learnt how to craft out a T20 performance before it became something that was so public. And, you know, I think the AFL will just take a, probably a year or two longer than what cricket did to kind of get into the same space and um, to get to this point where people are like, wow, this is the style of play that we, we want to play. And your own personal uh, performances in the WNCL competition, just some highlights uh, that I can think of, 21 wickets, uh, 09-10. Uh, the big one, though, that I could think of was the hat trick, 2012, 6 for 20 against the ACT. I can only think of a couple, couple of other hat-tricks in, in WNCL. Uh, talk us through that weekend because you, you followed it up with, I think, four for 12 in the T20 game on the, the same weekend. So 10 wickets in a weekend. Ha, is that just like one of those in-the-zone kind of weekends? I, I feel like it, it was more just one of those lucky moments in – you know, I don't. I think as a leg spinner, I'm not. I'm not sure. There's not too many games I reckon where you you sort of 
you feel like, you know what, I know where every single ball is, is going to go and, and I can control it. I can control the turn. I'm going to try, you know, like as a, as a leg spinner, you know, I always, I love talking to young leg spinners because I'm always like, where they, you know, they bowl a bad ball. I'm like, you know what, get used to this. You'll be doing it in your thirties bowling bad ball because <laughs> that, like, that, that's just, that's the, that's the art of it. Um, but I think, I think for me, it was probably more about, I was, I was a part of a good team and you just start to get some confidence in, in what you can do. And I, I think that that's what I remember the most is, is actually, I remember at the end of that sort of season going, actually, I, I can, I can play a genuine role here, not just sort of be making up the numbers here. I can, I can sort of, and I, I was one of those players that I spent as much time out of the team than in the team. Yeah. Um, and so I, I was sort of used to being dropped and, when T20 started, I actually started getting dropped a lot and I got dropped because I was told that we were going to go in with an off spinner instead of a leg spinner because leg spinners are too expensive. And so I'd always be in and out and I, I think that that particular season and off the back of that performance probably was the first time I started to go, oh, maybe, I, like maybe I'm not horrible at this. Like I, Maybe I can actually really start to, to shift what I'm trying to do. And so I, I feel like it was a bit of a... A, a turning point from a, a career point of view and it, you know it didn't mean instant success um over the next couple of years either but uh, I think uh, yeah I would I think that's an important moment probably in my career yeah and you you, you say you build the confidence and, and that confidence turns into a couple of years down the track uh having the opportunity to debut for Australia you you get the call up for the ODI series uh, involving Pakistan up in Brisbane. Can you talk us through that experience and h- how you found out? I, we were talking to Leah Poulton uh, a month or so ago and she said she found out she was picked in the Australian team via a letter in the mail. I'd be interested to know uh, how you found out that you got picked for Australia. Yeah, I, I remember it really clearly because I I look back on it and think like was I just not reading between the lines as to for what was happening and I'd been on an Australia A trip um it, it was it was in Australia and I it was a three day game against England that was it and I was like cool what a compliment to be a part of of that and that was sort of right at the end of the the season and then I got this email from Catherine Fitzpatrick who was coaching Australia and had coached me for most of my career at, at Victoria and she said would you be interested in coming up to Brisbane to net bowl to the Australian girls? And I was like, yeah, of course, like, I would love to. And so I got time off work, flew up to Brisbane and went to the first camp and, and just sort of, you know, bowled and I was around and I was like, oh, my goodness, these girls are so good. Like, this is embarrassing. And so I sort of did that and then they said, look, do you want to come to the next one? And so I think I've sort of been to a, maybe a couple of camps and, I just started to to be involved, and and I hadn't picked up anything. I was I was pretty much like, well, what a what a great opportunity to go to Brisbane and bowl on turf as a preparation for the upcoming season, and and didn't think much of it. And then Julie Savage, the chair of selectors, called me, and and I thought that was odd. Like, I obviously, didn't have a number in my phone, so you know, I just sort of answered the, answer the phone, and she said, I'm you know, I'm ready to let you know team selectors play for Australia, and I I actually said out loud, are you joking? <laughs> and she said, she's like, no, I'm not. And I, and I just sort of, yeah, I remember just hanging up the phone. I was shaking and, and crying. I was like, I, like, I, no part of me at all had thought about it. I didn't even know they were selecting a team. I didn't know who the tour was against. And I didn't even know when I'd hung up the phone because I remember chatting to, you know, ringing my family and letting them know. And they were like, oh, who are you playing against? I was like, no idea. I actually had no idea. Um, and so I, I, you know, managed to get the details and, you know, start, start to sort of piece it all together. But it was, yeah, uh, you know, I was 29 at the time, you know, you're not expecting anyone to, to call you and, and let you know, you're going to, you know, represent your country. And was the experience everything you hoped for when, when you finally got the, the chance to walk on the, on the field in Australian colours? Was it just the fulfilment of, of that dream that that little girl had when she's playing in the backyard in Launceston, uh, trying to spin the ball up the slope, um, did did it kind of sink in, or did it take a while? 
it, it, I think it took a while. It took a while to sink in. And then it, it for me, it, it felt like it took a long time. It felt like I belonged in that uniform, in that team. Um, so I think there were, there were sort of two parts to it. it you know, I, was, I just felt, you know, lucky. Um, I'd given up on the idea of playing for Australia. Um, I thought, you know what, you, you gave it a pretty good crack, but you, you didn't get there. Um, and I... People say, you know, do you feel lucky that you got the opportunity to play when you knew your game so well? And I was like, yeah, there, there are huge positives um, to that. I think it meant that I was grateful for every single moment of being an Australian player, you know, whether it was a two, running a 2K time trial or whether it was, um, you know, playing at the MCG or or just, you know, fielding a 1,000 balls. It, I was grateful for every single moment and every single person that I had that interaction with because I waited for so long and I knew that it wasn't going to last forever. So I knew that it, that tap on the shoulder, I was, you know, once I got handed the cap, it was pretty much like, all right, how long is it going to be till I get tapped on the shoulder here? So I think I got every inch out of it. I also say, don't get me wrong, I would have, I would have gladly been a 16 year old like Elise Perry and handed the cap. Um, with absolutely no idea, I would have been just as content to have played for Australia when I had. I most certainly didn't have the skill to do it either. But I, I do think it was. I think I was fortunate because I, I did make the most of of the opportunity, and I, and I wasn't, I wasn't therefore really disappointed when it got taken away because it was like, right, I've got this this moment in time. I'm going to enjoy every inch of it. I think the hardest thing was actually feeling like. I belonged. I think there there were so many talented players in that team, and they're they're still in that team. You know, they were significantly younger than me, but highly skilled, highly athletic. So it, it took me a long time to sort of not just be looking over my shoulder all the time and and assuming that you know I was going to get dropped or I wasn't good enough to be there. And um, you know, I, I think when I did feel comfortable within that team, I, I probably had about a twelve month period where I was like. Actually, I think I think I'm I'm good enough to be here, and I, I that time was was really special. Um, it, I think you you enjoy it more when you feel like you belong. You you you're not sort of jumping at shadows all the time, and you're really enjoying everyone's company. Um, and I and I remember that time a lot out of the sort of four or so years that I was involved. And the shirt number fourteen. Can you tell us about the significance behind that? Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's sort of a little bit twofold. You know, there's always gonna people are always gonna draw the parallels to, to Ricky Ponting, um, and that's um, and that's certainly there. It was obviously a very significant number worn by you know one of the greatest Tasmanian players of all time, and um, and I, they give you a sheet. So when you get selected, they send you this sheet that basically tells you all of the the numbers that are available, and it tells you sort of who's worn them. Um, so I, I looked down the sheet and, and Clear Smith's name was next to 14. And I thought that, that's actually perfect. I, I actually didn't select my shirt number for Victoria. Uh, so 26 is a number I've gone on to, to know and love, but I, I never selected the number. Um, it was actually, I got picked out of the blue for a random friendly against New South Wales at Punt Road. And that was the number that was in my size shirt. Yeah, wow. So, so I became 26. So when it came to playing for Australia and, and I could actually choose the number, I really wanted it to mean something. I, and I felt like those two reasons were, were really special. And I, I do love the romance of cricket. Um, I'm a big traditionalist. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that was really special for me that I was able to do that. And then, yeah, I got a, I got a phone call quite recently from Annabelle Sutherland who, then said, um, asked if she could wear the number as well. Um, so for me, like that was that said to me, like the romance of cricket's alive, everyone. It's a beautiful thing. And she was like, you know, what? I, w- I would love to wear fourteen, given that you and Clea wore it. And I, you know, I hope that you know many amazing Victorian players get the opportunity to wear fourteen, and you know, it can it can start a little chain of, of players over time. Now, speaking of the traditions and romance of cricket. Did you ever think you'd play a test match? No, definitely not. And uh, it, people ask about, you know, how important was that one test match? And I would have given up every other game I played for Australia to play one test match. And I, I think that 
the idea of that might shift over time and generationally given how young people see so much T20 and so much white ball cricket. But I think growing up and, you know, sitting and watching every minute and every ball of the Boxing Day test as a kid, you just want to play you just want to play test cricket. I, I wanted to play test cricket and um, it was such a, a special, special thing. And it, I, I knew I probably would only get the chance to do it once. Um, and there's a, there's a really cool photo of, of us sitting on the balcony in Canterbury, a group of us having a, having a beer. And it's, it's one of my greatest, photos and memories of going far out like it took every inch out of you over four days mentally physically trying to win this this one game and there's there's, there's no feeling like playing a, a test match and um it's the only time I felt it with playing only only the one test match so I know that every Australian female player just loves to play test matches and and hopes that you know, maybe in the future it can get to a, you know, potentially the top four countries playing off in, in some sort of test match, um, I guess, series would but would be a, a beautiful outcome, I think, for the game. Just on that, um, preparation to play a four-day game when traditionally your modus operandi is 50 over cricket and 20 over cricket, what what is the conditioning like in the lead into something like that because you're putting your body through an experience that you you're not accustomed to and you're having to execute your skills with your your body in fatigue situations uh and and mentally uh fatigued as well I would imagine I've I've never played more than two days in a row of cricket so I'd be interested to know um what that's like having to and having to do it in a test match yeah and uh, there was so many. There's so many little parts to it, which is what makes Test cricket so amazing. But it, it, it's the sum of all of those little things. You know, for for us, even just thinking about bowling with a red ball, and actually, it, it operates a little bit different. I, I get a little bit more drift as a leg spinner with a red ball. But then, how are we actually trying to manage that ball in terms of when it gets old? You know, then we're you're also thinking about all right, how do I switch off when I'm not in the play because I know that I can't be on for, you know, the full day because knowing you could be out there fielding for that period of time. So I I think it was more about mentally preparing for the test match than it was actually about the physical side of it. I I think at that time the girls had been working so hard from a fitness capacity that that sort of wasn't really an issue and, yeah, for me personally, I was a, a, a genuine tail ender, so I was used to trying not to get out in net sessions. So I was fairly, I was fairly convinced I'd do okay at not getting out in a test match. And from a bowling point of view, I, I just love to bowl. So I would find that I would, I could easily sort of knock out 15 to 20 overs in a, in a training session. So for me, it wasn't so much about that, but it was about thinking about the game differently. You know, how do you stay in a plan that might be a five over plan? Yeah. You know, these days in T20 cricket, it's a it's a one or two ball plan. Yeah, and then we're changing the fields and we're doing all these sorts of things. Whereas, actually, the the patience to stick in with something, uh, the gameplay around sort of the banter and the sledging and and all of those sorts of things, it it, it just felt like your your senses were always active, yeah. um, and that and that's what I truly loved about it. But just the exhaustion at the end of it. Um, Physically, but also emotionally, I think we just sort of sat there in silence after winning it and just sitting in the dressing room going, like, oh, we actually did that. Like, that was hard before that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Now, um, you get to experience a World Cup as well, 2017. You have a very good uh, tournament individually. Uh, can you talk us through the, the World Cup experience and, and what something like playing in a World Cup campaign means to you? Yeah, it was it was the most amazing experience and the most heartbreaking experience all at once. I mean, we were knocked out by India in the semi final in 2017. We were one of the favourites to be a part of it. The final was going to be at Laws. It was, you know, for me, I was sort of 32, I think, and and thinking that this was probably, you know, going to be about the time that that I got moved on. And you know, like it, it that's really, you know, it was it was such an important tournament. Um, there was a lot of pressure on us to win it. it. It was an amazing World Cup experience. You know, like it, it's 
tournament play. It's not playing the same opposition over sort of two or three or four or five games. It's actually playing different opposition, different grounds. The UK is really different as well in terms of the grounds. They're all sort of different shapes and sizes and the, the wind blowing in a different direction can, you know, mean that you should bat first or, you know, it, there was so much happening, but it was, it was, it was incredible. I, w- I actually wasn't in the starting 11. Um, I was actually named as the 13th in the practice game. So I was, I was pretty much of the, the opinion at that time I, I wasn't going to be in the 11. Um, yeah. Amanda Wellington was, the preferred spinner at that time. She ended up breaking a finger, which was heartbreaking for her. And um, it allowed the, the door to open for me to come in. And, uh, you know, as I said, I, I've always felt pretty grateful for the opportunity. And I, once I, once the door was open, I was, I was going to not just walk through it, but sort of burst my way through it and, and try and hang on. And, you know, I managed to, to play all by one game. I was left out uh, against New Zealand. Uh, who'd had the better of me uh, internationally over the, the previous years. And uh, so it was a, you know, it, it was an incredible thing to be a part of. And I felt like I'd, I'd sort of ridden the wave of being not in the team and making the team and staying in the team. And then, yeah, just a, a truly heartbreaking day um, to to not get through. And, you know, I, I, I ended up finishing my career having not won a, a World Cup and, um, which is probably quite rare given uh, how successful the Australian women's cricket team has been, you know, sort of after over the last sort of 10 to 20 to 30 years um, in, in that regard. But, you know, what, I wouldn't give up that experience for, for anything, even though it, it, it was a losing campaign, because I think you, you look back on that time, the pressure, the, you know, games in and out and, and working your way through it and, you, you know, it's, it's it's proper it's proper cricket in terms of just being under pressure all the time and you know, I, I kind of like being under pressure a lot from a from a playing perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Now uh wanna ask you about captaincy and you, you had a, a, a great time leading the Melbourne Stars and uh setting a setting a culture there at the Melbourne Stars. I'd like to ask you what you think makes a good culture at a cricket club and, and how as captain do you um, bring the team together and, and instill uh, that flavour, I guess, to a team? Can you tell us a little bit about uh, how, how, you, how you do that as a leader in a, in a cricket franchise? Yeah, franchise cricket's hard. I, I think you, you come in a, a week or two before the, the tournament starts, your overseas players sometimes are arriving, you know, a day or two before the first game. So it's a it's unique in that sense and it, it has to cut through all of the, the different cultures that exist around the country because you've got players coming in from other teams. So there's not this sort of instant, you know, if we were just a Victorian team playing T20 cricket, then we would sort of already know each other. We would know the style of play. There'd be all those sorts of things. So, you know, for me, it was about saying, well, maybe from a big bash point of view, it's something we should be deliberate in and, uh, for me, taking on captaincy, I, I, I really enjoyed captaincy. Um, but for me, it wasn't a, it, I didn't want it to be about me. I, I think I wanted it to be about the group owning the environment. Um, and I felt like if, if people felt like they had ownership on the environment and that they were accountable for what happened in the Melbourne Stars, then people would actually have really good skin in the game and, it would mean that it would drive us forward. And, and ultimately, your culture has to be about winning. Yeah, you have to be trying to win it. Um, and at times, you know, we, people would say, well, you know, maybe the Stars don't have the sort of team, you know, Meg Lanning's left, you know, they're not going to be any good and all that sort of stuff. And for me, it was about saying, well, we're still going to be trying to win it. Yeah. Because the reality is on any given day in a T20 format, that it actually doesn't matter who's on your list. You can, any team can win and, so for me, it was it was more about that. It was about it's about caring about each other for sure, and and for me, wanting to be connected, and that took me out of my comfort zone. I'm quite introverted, yeah. um, uh, you know, I'm not so much about the big groups. So I'd rather have one on one coffees, and um, so for me, it was it, with the stars it was about saying, you know what, I'm I'm not going to try and fill the shoes um, of Meg Lanning because I actually can't. You know, she's a wonderful leader, and there's a reason that she captains Australia. And I also can't fill the shoes of her from a playing perspective. 
And yep. so it, it just became about saying, well, this has to be done differently because we, we can't just do it the same way. It's not going to be the, you know, I, I can't just step in and, you know, I'm most certainly not going to step in and make 500 runs, that's for <laughs> sure. But, you know, I'm, I'm a different person and, and I'm going to go about it a different way. And so it, it was a little bit about being vulnerable in, in front of those girls and saying, you know, this is, this is what I want. This is what I'm passionate about. Um, and I am passionate about the Melbourne Stars. Um, I was lucky they, that's where I wanted to go. And I, re, I still remember Clint Cooper and David Hussey walking in to talk to the Victorian squad, um, as well as the Renegade CEO came in at, um, afterwards. And they were talking. And when David Hussey was talking about how he felt about the Melbourne Stars, I was like, that's what I want to be a part of. And so, uh, you know, being passionate about it and I wanted to be a one franchise player and, and to sort of do that. And I wanted people to love playing for the Melbourne Stars. Um, and if I felt like if we could shift the culture, then the performance side will come. And I, I do genuinely believe that. Um, and I believe that the Melbourne Stars could win the WBBL, you know, this coming season. And, you know, it's not about what I've done or, or anything like that. But I, I think that once you get things going in the right direction, then I think the winning, the winning can sort of look after itself. And I'm excited about their future and, and what they can do. And mixed emotions retiring or was it something that you just knew was the right time? Yeah, I, I had said I would go through until the end of, of that season and I, you know, I just, I didn't have anything left in the tank. I, I was just, I was spent and, and I thought, you know what, I can, I can hang on. I can definitely do that and play a couple more games for Victoria. But, you know, if I think back to when I started playing the game, it was, it was about doing it wholeheartedly. Um, and that was my decision to, to move to Victoria. And I, I felt like I couldn't do it wholeheartedly anymore. And I was like, that's so selfish if, if you just stick around. And, you know, I, I was, I'm living in Hobart. I was living in Hobart and sort of commuting back and forth and spending a week out of every month in Victoria to train with the girls, but doing a lot of training by myself. And I thought, you know, I don't, I don't want to do it anything other than my absolute best. And I also was under no illusions that the game was, starting to if not had already passed me by and that my best wasn't going to be the best uh, domestically anymore and uh, yeah I mean I hate losing and I'm pretty competitive so you know to to sort of feel like you're in a position where you're like you know what I'm, I'm here but I'm not I'm not able to make the contribution that I want to make ended up making it a, a really sort of easy decision and it was it was simply a matter of time to do it either after the big bash or after the end of the season, and I just thought, you know what, I'm just I'm going to do it now um, because I don't want to have, you know, I want to be the heart eyes emoji about cricket. <laughs> you know, I didn't want to be I didn't want to be anything else. I didn't want to I didn't want to be that sort of, you know, frustrated staring eyes emoji about cricket and think, well, you know, maybe I didn't, you know, maybe I hate the game or you know, maybe I feel like, you know, I shouldn't have. I just wanted to to pull the pin yeah. uh, while I still loved it. And so for that reason, I, I think it was well and truly the right decision. And I'm, I'm so content um, that I made the decision when I did. Your love of the game definitely still shining through. And it's something that I pick up when I'm driving around country New South Wales, listening to the ABC grandstand coverage to hear your voice on the radio, uh, giving descriptions and insights on the game uh, how enjoyable has it been being a part of that ABC grandstand commentary team? Well, you pinch yourself all the time because my grandparents still listen to Jim Maxwell on the wireless and they call <laughs> it the wireless. Um, so you, you know that it's such an important, you know, as that ABC grandstand coverage of Test Cricket is, is something that I think is special to so many people. So to be a part of it is, you know, it, is very, very cool and, I'm incredibly grateful to the ABC for giving me the opportunity and I, I, I feel like a real learner in, in that regard and I think I'm just starting to feel like at times within a, a commentary stint that I can actually sort of enjoy it. I think you, you feel actually so much pressure because you're, you're talking about test cricket but you're also talking about it on the ABC you know, with Jim Matsu and you, you know, there's a lot of pressure to, to sort of make sure that you give your best for, for that reason because it does mean so much to, to people but you know I'm, I think I'm not convinced yet that I'm, I'm any good at it but I 
I, I love talking about the game and, um, you know, working with some great people through the ABC has been really enjoyable. And, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to stick with it. And, uh, for as long as they're happy for me to, you know, chat about, chat about the game. And, uh, it's, it's a great seat to, and it's a great way to feel connected, I think, to the game, you know, when you're, when you're not playing anymore. And, uh, speaking of the current crop of players, uh, coming through, uh, young Georgia Wareham has slotted into that Australian side quite nicely, and there, there's other young spinners around. A- any any players we should be keeping an eye out for on the radar? Any anyone uh, from a spin bowling point of view that's caught your eye? Oh, there's there's so many of them, and, and I think that's the I think that's the really exciting thing about what's happening in the women's game at the moment is that sort of everyone was a right arm medium pacer. Um, and now we see so much diversity, um, especially with with spinners. And you know, there's so many. Having been a part of the under 18 national championship with the with the Tasmanian team this year, and seeing how many spinners are, are involved with with that team is is really exciting. You know, Victoria have just a wealth of of really talented young spinners. You know, Jess Field. Ella Haywood, there's there's so many young, talented, and you know at the moment they're sort of only sort of 15 or 16. But you know, look out in a couple of years' time, I, I think we're going to see so many young spinners dominating games of cricket because they're going to turn the ball big. And you know, as a as a leg spinner who didn't turn it very much, that um, genuinely warms my heart that we're going to see spinners just turning the ball big because. I think that what we see in Australia now is a, a really brave style of cricket, you know, whether it be batting, bowling, fielding, and where they, they want people to bowl fast, you know, like watching Taylor Valamic is one of the, the best things you can do in the game because she bowls rapid. Um, I, I'm excited to see what young spinners and, and young paces and young batters are going to do. But yeah, look out. Most of them probably come from Victoria, but I'm, I'm, I've got my fingers crossed that maybe a few little Tasmanian spinners might work, work their way through to, to play for Australia as well. Absolutely. And I just get you, your reflections too on the recent Women's World Cup, 86,000 plus people at the Melbourne Cricket Ground, Katy Perry's there, a, a major event in the history of women's cricket. What, what did that mean to you as a retired player, seeing something like that come to fruition? I, I think it was satisfying. I think for every person who was like, no, oh, they'll get 40000 at this. And if, if I had five bucks for every person who said that, then I could have kept playing cricket because um, <laughs> it would have paid me a pretty good salary, I reckon. Um, and so I, I just felt really satisfied that the that not only – that Australia got to that final and that, and that they won it. But the people are showing up to watch it and, and people people proved all of those people wrong. You know, there, there's always been this idea of, well, we can't put women's cricket on the TV because no one's going to watch it. You know what? People watch the WBBO and, and people are going to go to a game and people are going to tune in to watch this Australian team play. And, and that felt like a pipe dream you know, 10 years ago and it's, it's now, it's now our reality. And, and that's what I get really excited about. And, you know, with, with so many good friends in that team, you know, I feel um, just really happy for them that they got to their home you know, in, in chatting to Megan. She was just sort of relieved and, you know, even, even her journey back from a horrible shoulder injury in the, in the last world cup, 50 over world cup in 2017 to, to where, you know, it ended up. Um, you know, to see her sort of go through all of that and, and be standing on the MCG lifting up a World Cup trophy, you know, I, I feel so satisfied for her and, and the rest of the girls. Yeah, a, a magnificent occasion and uh, a real credit to everyone involved in, in that process of, of getting to that point. Now, we've we're, we're run out of time, but there's one last question I like to ask every guest on the Cricket Library podcast and uh, you've sounds like you've had some pretty good net sessions over the years, but if, if you had to pick three people, they can be cricketers, non-cricketers, alive, uh, no longer with us, uh, which three people would you most like to spend an hour in the nets with? Oh, that's such a good question. I would actually have to – the first person I would have to say is Elisa Healy because 
she and I, we used to call each other nemesis in the net <laughs> because we, I used to follow her across nets. Uh, we loved going head to head in battle. So I'm, I'm going to have to put her in. It'd be disappointing if I didn't have her in. Um, Catherine Fitzpatrick for banter, um, and bowling absolute heat. Yeah. And the great man, David Boone. Um, David was Clarence a great Boone. Mentor. Yeah, he was a great mentor of mine. I actually did bowl to him in the net when I was about, oh, I must have been about 19 maybe or 20. Wow. And uh, he asked, yeah, he said, we, I was working at Cricket Taz and he said, can you come and have a bowl to me? I'm playing in a charity game. And I thought, this is going to be the most amazing story of all time because I'm going to be able to tell all my mates that I knocked over David Boone in a net session. Well, couldn't get him out. He was cutting me <laughs> off leg stump and it was the most heartbreaking thing. So I tell everyone, I mean, I drop that name all the time, but I did have a boulder, but I could not get him out. So I'm going to go with that three. And, and you're still best mates with Booney? We, uh, yeah, we still sort of check in every now and then. He's just, he, was, he was a really great person. He, he, he was very much around you know, make sure you have career as well. But, you know, he he allowed me to travel between Tasmania and Melbourne and the the reality is if I hadn't have been afforded that opportunity, I, I would have never gone on to, to move to Melbourne and, you know, follow, follow that dream. So, um, yeah, I'll always be so grateful to, to his influence on me as a, as a person and as a player. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the Cricket Library podcast, Kristen. I've had an absolute pleasure uh, hearing more of your story and really appreciate you sharing it with our listeners and would love to wish you all the best for your future endeavours. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you so much. A massive thanks to Kristen Beams for joining us on the Cricket Library podcast today. Wonderful to hear about her cricket journey and how she has forged a career for herself, taking big risks, really, as a youngster growing up in Launceston, learning the game, her parents really supporting her and helping her to have every opportunity to love and enjoy cricket and then to get to a point where she needed to make that crunch decision to to go all in and move to Melbourne and and that wonderful experience she had at EMP playing club cricket there and that premiership she won at her club side being one of her fondest memories of playing cricket with all the other achievements uh, included in there, uh, those one day internationals, the T20s, the test match, What a wonderful experience that would have been for her to put on the baggy green cap and represent Australia with distinction the way that she did. Uh, A wonderful story and one of many great stories that we've got lined up for you on the Cricket Library podcast. A massive thanks to everyone who has taken the time to give us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. That's really helpful. And everyone who shares the love, so to speak, and and tell tell your friends about the Cricket Library podcast because we believe these are stories worth telling and stories that will inspire a love of cricket and and that's our aim is to to really inspire a love of cricket in uh, our listening audience and keep the love of the game alive as as Kristen said the emoji with the love heart eyes is is probably what we're trying to achieve here so a big thanks to Kristen and keep your eye out for things coming up From the Cricket Library podcast, we are looking forward to bringing you some great interviews in the coming weeks and months. This has been Matt Ellis for the Cricket Library podcast. Bye for now.